So hi everyone, my name is Michał. I work at Akatoyo Technology, and I'm going to talk about practical, very practical side of streams. I'm going to implement, I'm going to show you how to implement a, a multiplayer web game using streams as building blocks for both front-end and back-end parts. I will also introduce all necessary stream concepts as we go. There will be lots of diagrams and code snippets, so if you have any questions, just please ask them. What are streams? A very brief introduction. So streams are yet another way of defining application logic. They are also a concurrency model. From the concurrency models on the slide, uh, those one are, uh, streams are the most abstract one. And they are the most abstract one uh, because we are, as programmers, we are focusing only on data transformation. So only the gray rectangle in the middle is something that we write. And by data, we usually mean things like floats, ints, lists, and arrays. But surprisingly, or not, code can also be treated as data. So you will see a streams of functions and how those can be applicable. And the third and most exciting and important thing about streams is, I, is uh, that they can deal, help us deal uh, more conveniently with uh, time, the programmer's worst enemy. And uh, when you are programming using streams, you don't care about what has just happened or what will happen next, you just care about the current data transformation. Uh, on the slide, you can see a picture that I will use throughout the whole presentation, and uh, the time flows from left or to right. Those empty objects are uh, empty. Those empty circles are empty objects in the stream, and the far right element is the oldest one. This all means that we are becoming declarative programmers. So we are programming using descriptions of transformations, not instructions for the whole algorithm like in the imperative world. This also means that our systems and our, our code becomes more testable and maintainable because we are using pure functions more frequently. At the end of the presentation, I'd like to, to have an opinion about streams as a concept. And this talk is divided in, into three parts. In the first part, I will, I will implement a web game using JavaScript and BaconJS for streams. And then we'll move over to the server side when I use Scala and Akka in order to implement a multiplayer web game for this client, in order for the more players to join. And to cool things down, at the end I will explain what's the difference between reactive streams and streams, and we'll talk about, briefly talk about uh, uh, asynchronous communication and how can we make it safer. Okay, let's meet the main characters for today. And uh, the gray area is the board, the green uh, square is our protagonist, the snake, and the uh, red square is fruit. It's a static thing that we'll, uh, we'll need to eat as many as possible during the game. And here's the first stream, a stream of ticks. So it's a uh, stream that outputs an empty object every 100 milliseconds. How can it be useful? So let's try to get this tick stream as an input stream to a first streaming operator of today. There will be six of them, and map is the first one. So what map does, it takes the input stream, in this case, it's a tick stream, and maps every element in this input stream with a function that always returns a constant vector 0, 1. So what we get in return is we get an output stream, a new stream, which outputs 0, 1 vector every 100 milliseconds. And we'll call it, sorry, we'll call it a z uh, direction stream. So this is a stream that produces a new direction for the snake. Next up, we can take this direction stream and scan it, the second operator, and scan it with a, a, new, uh, a new function and an accumu accumulator value. So what scan does, it accumulates values uh, from the input stream. But it also needs an initial value. So vector 0, 1 is initial value that we provide at the beginning. And the second, uh, the second line is the function that is used in order to accumulate new values from the input stream. And what this function does, it simply adds things to the accumulator. Every time accumulator changes, a new accumulator is calculated, it is output to this output stream. So we will call this stream snake's head positions. Every time uh, head of the snake changes, we'll have a new value in our in output stream. So two operators, the first one, map, it takes a function, we provide a function, and this function is used to map every element from the input stream, and this function, this operator produces a new stream, uh, a new stream which has only the mapped values, and the second operator is scan, which uh, also takes the provided function f, 
and uses it in order to accumulate values in this input stream. And this is how it looks in JavaScript code. So really, I just and on the slides you, you also see in a JavaScript code. So um, we have a tix, which is created uh, with this simple function, and then we uh, have directions and snake head positions and map and scan. So this is a real code. What we can do with snake head positions stream is we can provide a terminal function. In this case, it's display. So on each value, what this says, on each value, on each new value in this snake heads positions stream, uh, we send this value to the display function. And in, in this case, in this project, this is just sent to this React component, and React component just uh, displays it. Uh, what's cool about that is that streams are reusable. So we uh, provided one terminal function, which is display, but what we can also do with the same stream is that we can send it, uh, send the new values to server and persist them and whatever, right? So these streams are reusable. And the second cool thing about them is that if there are no elements or no terminal function provided, there's nothing happening uh, underneath, under the, uh, behind the curtains, curtains, so no CPU cycles at all. And this is the game we have right now, so uh, snake is moving down all the time, so 0, 1 vector every 100 milliseconds, and player has no control over it whatsoever. So let's change it, because it's not a game yet, right? Uh, let's change it. Let's create a new stream, a key presses stream. Uh, what this stream does, it, it outputs a new object with event inside every time user presses a, a key on the keyboard. Any key, any key is pressed, and the value is output to this uh, stream. What we can do with that is that we can filter the the third operator, we can filter uh, values from this input stream, which is key presses stream, and only output the values which are left key presses. Similarly, we can do for right key presses. So we have uh, new two new streams, right, left key presses, whenever user presses a key, there's an object in the stream, and right key presses, whenever user presses a right key, there's an object in this output stream. So this is a filter operator. We need, as programmers, to provide a predicate p, a function, and whenever this predicate is satisfied, the value from this input stream is passed to this output stream. And also it produces a new stream with only the values that passed, that satisfied the condition we provided. What we can do next, and this is the tricky part, is we can uh, map, you reuse this operator again, we can get this left key presses stream, so every time user, press, user presses a key, we have a, a key there, this is an input stream, we have a, an object there and this is an input stream, we can map this stream with a function that always returns rotate left function. So what will be there in this output stream that we'll call left rotations? So this is a question for you. Anybody? Yeah. So. Thank you very much. So there will be a function. So what we get, left rotations is a stream of functions. Not applications, just functions. So what we have right now, every, every time user presses a left key, in this left rotation stream, there will be an, an object with a function that we need to use in order to transform the current direction. Rotate left, what it does, it transforms that vector, rotates the vector 19 degrees to the left. We can do a similar thing with rotate right. Uh, but we provide another function, so we just get the right key presses um, stream and map it with this function that always returns a function. In this case, rotate right. What we can do next is we can use the fourth op operator, merge, in order to get those two uh, left, key, uh, left uh, rotations and right rotation streams to one, and we'll call it action stream. So action stream, what we have right now is whenever users presses a button, left or right, that means that user wants to change the direction, we have a function that we need to use in order to change that direction in this stream. Whenever it, whenever users wants it, we have this function, this object in this output stream, which we'll call actions. And merge, again to sum up, what merge does, it takes two input streams, and every time there is a new uh, object or element in either of those, it is output to this output stream. Okay, so we have a new direction stream. We, we can create it by using this action stream and again scan over uh, this stream 
to produce a new direction. And again, scan accumulates values. So the first value, this is an initial value 0, 1. So this is our initial direction, as we, had right, uh, as we have right now. And the function that accumulates those values, what it does, it takes direction. Direction here is an accumula accumulator value. So in the first call, this will be 0, 1. And f here is the value, input value from this input stream. So whenever there is a new value in this stream, this will be the value. And we'll call this value f, because we know that actions uh, action stream contains functions. And then this function that we provide always generates a new value for this output stream, uh, for this accumulator, sorry. So uh, in this case, we just provide a new direction by providing, uh, by applying this, this current direction, this current accumulator to this function f that we got from the input stream. So as you see, we can just rotate by pressing left, we can rotate left. And by pressing right, we can rotate right. So the direction will change uh, whenever user wants to change it. So this is a new direction stream. And to recap, this is how all direction stream looks like right now. So what's the difference? Uh, of course, the one is that the player has control, uh, control over it here. But what's the, what's the uh, other difference? So this is the recap. So what's the difference? This is all direction stream, and this is a new direction stream that takes player into consideration. What's missing here in our new approach? Yes, so we have no time at all. So what we have, what we had so far, we had a tick uh, tick stream that uh, was taken into consideration, right? So the the snake was moving down and down and down. But right now, we just lost, uh, lost timing, and we just change direction each time user presses a key. So snake will always move whenever user presses a key. So let's fix that. And uh, we can fix that by, by applying the fifth operator, which is called sampled by. Sampled by it takes two streams. The first one is the value stream, and the second one is the tick stream. And uh, ticks, whenever there is a new value in the tick stream, in the second input stream, uh, the output stream will contain the latest value from this value stream. So this may sound a little bit confusing, but let's see how it uh, can be applied. So you see that values is the directions that user changes. Every time user changes the direction, the direction of the snake changes. So this is the first input stream, and the second input stream is tick stream. So empty object every 100 milliseconds. And uh, what you see right now is that every time there is a new value in tick stream, we take the latest value from the value stream and output it here. So right now, we have a new direction stream, which, is, uh, which has time uh, inside and also uh, user input. What's cool is that snake head positions, which we defined uh, before, it doesn't need to change at all. So we just changed one direction stream, and this block of code can be re reused again. Uh, so the snake head positions uh, accumulate all the di change directions to produce a new uh, new snake head position. Okay, this is how it looks in the JavaScript code. And uh, again, it's very similar to what, you, what you've seen on the slides. And bacon, uh, sorry, keys, left, right, left rotations, which is a func uh, function stream, right rotations against function stream, actions, which is a merge of those, and uh, directions is just sampled by ticks. Okay, so it's very, very straightforward. So current implementation, this is how it looks like. And uh, it uses 10 streams and five streams operator in order to produce something like that. So the, the problem here is that the snake is just one head, so let's quickly fix it. And let's introduce the, le the last operator of today. It's called sliding window. What it does, it, it, uh, we pass a n integer value. And what it does, it takes last n elements from input stream and outputs them as one element, array of those last elements. So we can see that uh, uh, we, when providing two, we can see that we, have, we can have a snake stream, which is just two positions that need to be rendered as green squares in order to produce a nicely looking snake. And now I will show you a demo in, in a bit, but before a demo, you need to take a quiz. Okay, so uh, how can we implement eating a fruit? So by eating a fruit, I mean let's create a stream which outputs a value every time snake eats a fruit. 
every time snake is a fruit, we need to have a value in the stream. We can render it uh, however we like, but let's just focus on the stream. And let's reuse one of those six operators you already know, and let's reuse one of those 11 streams you already know. So just shout the name of the operator uh, and the name of the stream. Please do. Eating a fruit. Filter, cool. And head positions, very nice. Thank you very much, very, very good answer. So as you see, we can take the head positions and just filter every new head position with a, a static value of the fruit. So whenever this value is really the same, we output it to this fruit eaten events stream. So every time the head is on the fruit, we generate fruit eaten event, okay? Let's see it in action. So let's see how, it, uh, how it's implemented. Uh, I haven't been lying to you, so the code really, the code really looks like that. And so all the things you've seen so far are more or less here. And uh, NPM started, so this is how it looks like. I'm just pressing right, right, left, left, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still a, a early morning, right, so. Okay, yeah. I'm pretty, no, I'm not good at that. Ah, uh, okay, it's, it's not so easy as, as you may thought. So, uh, yeah, after the presentation, you please join me here and show me how it's done. Uh, okay, thank you. This is the front end part. This is how, it's, uh, how it looks like. And you can take the whole application that we've already implemented and uh, draw it like this. So this is a flow. This is architecture of the, our front-end solution. All the rect rectangles here are just, oh sorry, <laughs> are just new streams, and arrows are uh, the transformations, the operators we applied. So for example, ticks were mapped to directions, right? So the map is this one arrow. So this is our general architecture of the whole solution. This is can be, the, this approach is called top-down, right? So we, we, we see our architecture from the, uh, from the top. Okay, so let's go multiplayer. Now, what we want to have, we want to reuse the JavaScript part and just uh, be able to connect as another player. So let's do a two-player implementation for now. And uh, we'll use Scala and Akka for that. So requirements for the Snake server application. Clients need to send their position and their name to the server, right? So this is the first, uh, the first thing we need to do. And also, server needs to generate new fruits so that everybody knows which is the new one, and it needs to be the same. And server keeps the scores of each player. Uh, and of course, if they keep it, uh, if the server keeps it and generates it, it needs also to broadcast it. I will use streams to implement all those requirements because it's the easiest thing to, thing to do, right? So let's try to do a top-bottom approach, a top-down approach, sorry. Uh, this, we'll try to first implement the flow, the basic architecture of the server application, and then we'll implement this question mark at the end. So there's just one block of code. So the general architecture, I think, should be uh, like that. Player state is the client, one player sends the states. So where is my snake and what's my name? So this is a player state. It sends it to the server. A server does his job and uh, then produces a game event. And the game event should be sent back to the client and all, uh, all, the others client, uh, all the other clients. Player states, fruits, and scores should be inside this game event. Technically speaking, we can use WebSocket connection. So every player that joins our, uh, our game should open the new WebSocket connection. And what, it, what, sh what this sh uh, WebSocket connection should do, it should accept all the player states from this one player and reuse the same WebSocket connection in order to send the game event back. Okay? Right? So what we have is we, we have one stream uh, that is connected between client and the server. In Scala and Akka HTTP, we can do something like that. So this is the boilerplate that we need to uh, right in order to create a WebSocket server. 
And we are using, uh, under the path snake socket, we'll have a WebSocket connection, uh, web, WebSocket connection. So this is a handle WebSocket messages uh, function, which is a helper function. And as you see, what this helper function gets is a flow. So this is our question mark from this previous slide. So this is a real flow. The flow that connected streams, with, which are mapped with some oper stream operators. And that's all. Then we need to bind, of course, to the port and, and things like that. But that's all you really need in order to implement a WebSocket server. And uh, speaking very, uh, very generally, this is the, the flow that I've shown you for the uh, client application. So this is a client flow. And this is a server flow, which we'll implement in a bit. And uh, this is our WebSocket connection. So player states are moving from the client to the server, and game events uh, like player, other player states, fruits, and scores are going to the other direction through the same WebSocket connection. OK, now, the thing you implemented, fruit eating events, can be moved to the server uh, very, very straightforward. So we just filter uh, every snake head and produce a new fruit uh, at the end. So what we can do is we can get this eaten events uh, stream and map it with a new random vector. So every time there is a new function, there is a new object in this eaten event. So every time snake eats it, it's a fruit, it's a fruit. We generate a new random vector, which is a new fruit. So this is our fruit stream, right? This is how it looks in Scala code. So uh, as you see, this fruit flow is something that we generally uh, just designed, and the flow type is very very important one. So flow type, what it does, it takes two types as, uh, as an input, as parameterized uh, things. So uh, the first input type, the first type is an input thing. So the flow is one in, one out. And the in type is list of player positions. And the out type is fruit position. So this is something like that. What we get is this player positions here. And what we get out is a new generated fruit position, right? So this is how it looks like. So fruits uh, are the thir first thing that we, that we did. Now let's focus on scores. We can reuse the same eaten events uh, stream that you implemented and map it over with, uh, with the function that always returns one. And we'll get a score updates uh, stream. What we can do next is we can get the score updates and just accumulate values to produce a score stream for this part particular one player. This is how it looks in Scala code. So again, we use the same flow type, which uh, takes a fruit, uh, fruit position as an input type and produces int uh, as output type. Okay. So it, what it does, it just uh, gets a new a new fruit position, and whenever it's new, really new, so newly generated, we have one, and if it's still the current one, it's zero, and we scan over it with the zero as first. Uh, initial value, and that's all. So we produce int based on fruit position. So this is a second very small flow that we did, right? Again, this is uh, the second thing. And the last thing is player state. So what we need to do, uh, again, we'll need to be able to send other player states. But this is the last thing that we need, need to do. This is a game logic, logic flow. So it's smaller than the client one, uh, surprisingly. Uh, again, all those rectangles are streams, or those arrows are stream operators. So it's very, very straightforward, simple uh, implementation. What we need to do is we need to connect them like in this picture. So we just have uh, implementations of uh, all of them individually. Now we need to combine them. And in order to combine them, uh, I'm showing you the comment of the method I, I will show you in a bit before Aka DSL, Aka graph DSL, Aka streams graph DSL is not very nice to show in presentations. I will do it anyway, but first I will want to show you the comment. So what we need to do is uh, whenever we need, whenever we have flow, one in, one out, it's very straightforward, right? The code looks looks cool. One in, one out. One fruit position in, one in out. But if we need something else like a block which takes one thing and outputs two things, we need to use broadcast block here and uh, of course here. So player state is used in two different places inside our flow, so we need to broadcast it. And fruit position is used in, diff in two different things in our flow, so we need to broadcast it. And the opposite thing is zip. So we need to produce a new game event zip based on three different sources, 
So it's three in, one out, or n in, one out block, zip, right? And this is how it looks, the implementation. Uh, you may be surprised that we still get flow, again, a flow type as a return type. It's flow of from player state to game event. So player state comes in, the, player, the state of the client, my position and my name, and we get game event back. So how it, how it can work like that? So as you see, we have this very complicated graph, but this graph, really what it is, it's one in, one out still, right? So we just what we just did is we just wrapped it, wrapped the whole very complicated advanced graph in a very simple one, which is called game logic flow, which is just one in, one out. Okay, so let's move to the player states. The, in order to produce a new player state, that is, for example, player A and B are playing together. And in order for player A to know what is the position of player B, uh, we need to get the position from player B WebSocket connection to player A WebSocket connection, right? right? So we need to cross this border here, uh, asynchronous border. So uh, we can do it, and this uh, I implemented a new block, which is called game broadcast block, which I don't have time to show right now, and it's uh, and pretty complicated. Uh, as an idea, but a very, very simple implementation. You can see it in, um, uh, in the code uh, at, uh, during the demo. Okay, so now we have all the, the blocks that we need in order to implement the flow, which is passed to this handle WebSocket uh, messages at the, at the beginning. So what ACA uh, HTTP takes to really service the WebSocket, incoming WebSocket connection. And as you see, it's again this flow type it takes message, which is WebSocket message, and outputs a message, which is a WebSocket message. And what it does, it, it's logging all incoming traffic. All incoming things from, the, from the, this particular client is locked using this message logger. Then we collect, we take the text out of this WebSocket message, then we parse this text because we want it to be JSON, because this is our contract, and then convert it to player state case class. Then we just pass this player state via the game logic flow which we implemented, and then via the game event broadcast flow which I talked about, and then uh, get this JSON back, game event JSON, and parse it uh, to string, or, or transform it to string, and then to text message which is a WebSocket message. So this is the whole application. Really, this is the whole application, together with the HTTP binding I shown a few slides earlier. And uh, as you see, those small blocks can be implemented separately and, of course, tested and maintained separately. So let's see in action. Uh, so this is the uh, Snake multiplayer implementation, 115 lines of code. This is the flow I talked about. This is, uh, uh, this is the, the thing that is used here. Here. And yeah, that's pretty much all. This is our graph, this is the comment. Okay, so it's 115 lines of code, but 20 lines is uh, this one big comment. Uh, yeah. So this is how it looks like. Let's try, to, let's try to run it. And see whether it works or not. Okay. Compiling. server started. Uh, as you see, the score is now 0, 0, because the client uh, is uh, now a multiplayer client. Now let's uh, get another window. This will be pretty, pretty asynchronous multiplayer game, because I'm just one player. I will be switching the windows. So first, uh, yeah, I'm going to build up my score with this one. As you see, the score is changing. Yeah, I'm better now. And we can just switch to the other one and try to get a tie. Ah. Ah. 
Ah, okay. As you see, the collisions are not supported yet because I haven't shown you how to implement it. I'm not lying, so this is the only code I, I really wrote uh, for this game, so no collisions. But uh, please uh, think about how to implement collisions in such a game. So uh, what happens if they're just going straight uh, to each other and uh, who should get the score or, uh, or not? So this is the backend in action. And now, to cool things down, at the last part of the presentation, imagine that th this is not, not a two-player uh, two snake game, but thousands of players can join. Uh, there are games like that, right? Infinite board and thousands of players or thousands of snakes play together. Uh, so what we, the, 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 the very bad thing about this solution is that we need to merge all those WebSocket connection in outputs, the player states, uh, in order to produce one to, to get to the client, right? R right now, this solution would not be scalable because we really want to draw all the other players. Uh, but this is not the, the worst part, the, the performance. The worst part is that we need to cross this asynchronous connection and, uh, and uh, asynchronous boundary, and every time we do that, we uh, can get a memory uh, out of memory exception. And why is that? So every, uh, whenever you have two, at least two asynchronous systems, one of them is faster, one of them is faster. And classically, we have uh, two approaches in order to, uh, to deal with that. The first one is push model. So uh, publisher just pushes mes messages every time they are generated, no matter what. And this uh, solution is not really safe whenever the subscriber is slower. Why is that? Because uh, the publisher is faster, so it produces the messages faster, uh, and the buffer of the uh, subscriber will over overflow somewhere. Uh, but this solution is very, very good. It's perfect if the subscriber is faster, because pr pr uh, publisher, uh, the pace of the publisher is so slow that the subscriber buffers cannot really overflow because it's faster to, to process them. On the other hand, the pull model, what it does, it implements the please message. So please get me this message, right? Please give me this, this one. It's very slow when subscriber is faster because we, what we do uh, here is uh, we are sending two, twice as many messages to convey one, convey one piece of information. We need to uh, send two messages in order to get one, inf uh, one piece of information. But it's perfect if subscriber is slower. Why is that? Because what this please message, message actually does, it, uh, it tells, it allows subscriber to tell the publisher to really hold back for a bit, right? Please do not send me because I haven't asked for this new message, so please don't send me any new message. And that's why it's safer because buffers will not overflow when subscri because subscriber is in control of the pace. So those are, those are two classical models and reactive streams are uh, basing on those two ideas. So reactive streams are as fast as possible, but not faster. And we have a, a demand, which is this please message. And uh, the consumer can just say, please give me 100 million messages to the producer. So what, what, is, what it does, it just says, I'm able to process those 100 million messages, right? So please just give me, this is generating the demand. And only then, after receiving this kind of message, publisher can produce and send those five, those 100 million messages at its own pace, whenever it wants. So it supplies those elements until the demand 100 million is satisfied. So sometimes reactive streams are called streams with supply and demand, but also you can, uh, you can see in some documentations that uh, they are called back pressure streams. And whenever there is lack of demand, whenever the, s the consumer says, uh, doesn't say, please, give me X messages, uh, what it does, actually, it's just back pressures, right? It says, hold back, don't do, don't, do, don't do anything. An example of that, so let's see. Those are four asynchronous systems. And one publisher at the left, and one subscriber at the uh, right, and in the middle, you have two processors. What processor is, is just subscriber and publisher in one system. So first, those arrows to the left are demand. So first, subscriber, nothing happens until subscriber generates demand, right? So this left arrow. Only then, the demand is passed over to the publisher system, and only then the publisher can generate this, this new information and pass it uh, downstream to processor. And then processor 
passes it to another processor and processor and second processor to subscriber. So uh, processor are just forwarding the, the dem demand and forwarding the data back. What it can also does is that each processor, for example, can have only uh, three, it can need only three messages in order to produce one. So it also can map demand and information uh, but what it needs to do, it needs to take into consideration the downstream demand that always uh, is, should be there in order to send something. So a question for you, the last one, uh, no, the previous to last one, and what happens if this processor here uh, sends messages whenever it wants? So, you know, ah, now 500, 500. What can be said about the whole system then? Is it reactive streams compliant? Is it safe? Are there any buffers that can be overflown or not? If only one of those systems just sends messages whenever it wants. Come on, don't be shy. It's not reactive streams. Yes, so thank you very much. So what you need to understand is this, it's all or nothing. So every system in your application, every asynchronous module needs to be reactive streams compliant in order for the whole systems to be reactive streams compliant. And reactive streams compliant means that it's safe, no buffers will overflow. Whenever you don't have this kind of assurance, some buffers may overflow somewhere. And uh, there is a reactive streams org uh, page, which is just um, uh, some kind of instruction, what this protocol is about, how to implement it, and things like that. And this API is just one jar. One jar with four classes and seven methods. So all I, uh, all I told you now, uh, for now is uh, it can be implemented using this API. And in fact, uh, it, it may, may sound very simple to implement, right? After knowing this demand and, and uh, supply, but when you see a GitHub page, each of those seven methods uh, have like 20 or, or 30 corner cases that you need to uh, take into consideration. For example, while the subscription is not canceled, calling subscription cancel may cause the publisher, if stateful, to transition into the shutdown state if no other subscription exists at this point. And C1.9, so a different method to see details. So it's very, very hard to implement. And, but you can still do it. You can try to implement it. And you have a TCK, te Technology Compliance Kit, uh, that will check whether all those assumptions are met in your uh, application. And after a few weeks, months, or years, you may have a new uh, Reactive Streams compliant library. But if you don't want to do that, you can just reuse implementations that are already there. So all those systems on the slide, ACA, which I use, JDK9, some integrations, Kafka, Mongo, Cassandra, all of them implemented this API, this Reactive Streams uh, API, which is in this one jar. Mm, so systems implemented in, in different kinds of uh, libraries can also talk to, with each other and be safe. So knowing all, uh, knowing all that, we can now see uh, what is our flow type. Our flow type under the hood, what it does, it implements a processor. It implements one of those methods in this Reactive Streams API. So our snake implementation is using reactive streams. And the last question for you is, knowing all this, can you answer me this question? Is the snake multiplier I've shown you safe or not? Are there any buffers that can be overflown or not? Okay, it's okay. thank you very much. Very, very good answer. It's not, it's not safe. Uh, front end is just pushing every 100 milliseconds, right? No, no. Uh, it's not taking into consideration any demand from the server. So its clients are always pushing every 100 milliseconds, that's all. So it's not Reactive Streams compliant. But we can make it compliant mm, pretty quickly, I think. So there are some, there are some Reactive Streams web, web frameworks, and uh, for example, RxJS. Uh, I, I think they are very close to, to implementing that. Also, we can use Conflate or Expand on the server side, so this kind of uh, uh, ex uh, we, we can extrapolate some values, right? Or interpolate some values depending on which system is faster. And also we can have a buffer, a very safe buffer, which has a strategy whenever 
there are more messages that I can hold. What should I do with this message? So there are buffers like that in ACA streams. Okay. And the, these are the links. Uh, the ACA streams I use, BaconJS I use, and server-side code is on my GitHub, client-side code is on my GitHub, and also there's a blog post that you can follow easily and implement all the steps uh, of the Snake game for yourselves. My name is Michal, this is my blog, this is my Twitter handle, handle and thank you very much for attention. I don't know if we have any time for questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. I'm here today, so please uh, just grab me and we can talk more. Thank you very much.